The following program may contain coarse language, violence, nudity, mature subject matter, or scenes which may not be suitable for all viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome back, everyone. I must tell you that the last guest uh, still has me scratching my head wondering what the hell they were talking about. You ever have one of those days? Well, I'm a pretty lucky guy because right now I'm bringing on a guest that we've had on many times before. Very interesting, very credible. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, and we're going to be talking about ghosts, hauntings, things that go bump in the night. I'm not talking about your husband or your boyfriend or your wife when they come home from the bar. Dale Kazmarek is my guest this hour, and he is the president of uh, Ghost Research, right, Dale? Ghost Research Society. Mm -hmm. ah. Welcome back to the x -Men. Always great uh, seeing you and speaking with you. How have you been? I've been good. I've been good. I've uh, been very busy uh, starting up my uh, spring investigative season here, I guess. Uh, but as you know, Chicago, I don't know how it is in Canada, but I know Chicago, their winter wants to hang on forever. Oh, I know. It's, it's, it's horrible. And according to uh, weather scientists, here in the Ontario region where we live in the uh, Niagara region, it has been the gloomiest winter on record. Um, I, th I think Chicago will probably be a uh, close second. I mean, we oh, seem right. to have like six months of winter and a couple of months of summer. We don't have no spring or fall here, really. Yeah, same same here, same here. Uh, when is your busiest season? I, I would imagine that Halloween in that part of the fall is busy for you, but are you busy all year round? Yeah, I mean, pretty much. We, we do things, investigations, and uh, our research uh, year round. Uh, mm -hmm. We start breaking out the equipment to do you know outdoor investigations, hopefully, you know, in April, and we run through uh, October or November, whenever the season begins to get bad again. And mm -hmm. even during the off season, we tr we try to do uh, internal investigations where we're going into you know private home businesses, places like that, when we don't have to go out in the harsh weather. The type of investigation that you do, does it vary according to the time of year as well as the weather itself? Uh, it can. Um, in some cases, for instance, if uh, give you an example, we just got back from a, a four day, five day trip to uh, northern Alabama to do investigations mm -hmm. out there uh, into a spook light, a ghost light, which is also one of my passions. I wrote a book on it uh, called Illuminating the Darkness, the Mystery of Spook Lights. And Sometimes those things are only seen according to the eyewitnesses down, down there during certain times of the year, for instance. Um, it, even though it was 80, 70, 80 degrees down there, which was a, a respite from the Chicago weather up here. I mean, it was a nice vacation. Uh, it seemed like uh, some of those, uh, I only saw really one or two that I could maybe claim might be paranormal. Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed to have more of those show up at, as we get closer to the summer. So. You, kind of tailoring our investigations pretty much to when the phenomenon is, is uh, often, uh, you know, uh, seen by people. You mentioned one of the books you've written. How many books have you written all told, Dale? I've written uh, six books uh, as of right now. I hope to be able to write a few more uh, in the upcoming years. And are they available on Amazon.com? Uh, they're on Amazon.com. Um, uh, they're also <clears throat> directly through my website as well. Um, so people can go either way. And that's Ghost Research, um, ghostresearch.org. Oh, we've got to get a plug in for your books, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. Um, how did you get started in investigating the paranormal for the listeners and viewers who haven't had the, the opportunity of meeting you before? Well, I think, again, I want to blame this uh, spooky hobby of mine on my parents. <laughs> uh, because, you know, they... Seriously, they started telling me ghost stories when I was oh, yeah. quite young. I mean, five, six, seven years old. Um, my dad actually was uh, sort of the ghost hunter of the family, so to speak. Oh. Um, uh, my, my mother, uh, she, she enjoyed doing that, but it was uh, during my uh, parents when they were uh, still dating, 
uh, you know, just prior to uh, World War II, uh, my dad was in the Merchant Marines, and um, he uh, used to drive past the cemetery a lot, a rather large uh, Polish Catholic cemetery uh, in our area called Resurrection Cemetery, to look for the so-called hitchhiking ghost story that's been seen since the latter 1930s. And this was often after a date, taking my mom out, uh, or mom-to-be, out on a date, you know, a movie, a show, a theater. And then my mom always figured out that you know, on Saturday night, this is what, what, what the, the modus operandi would be, you know, taking her past this you know, creepy cemetery in the middle of the night looking for the ghost. Now, my mom was not at all happy with it. <laughs> Uh, she was um, uh, would have off the screen with my dad, and said, you know, take me home. I don't want to see the ghost, and they never saw the ghost. But it was these right. kind of stories that I had told to me as a youngster. In fact, that was the very first ghost story I was ever told of this hitchhiking ghost story. As a paranormal investigator, have you ever investigated any ghost hitchhiker stories? Oh, absolutely, quite a few. Um, you know, the whole idea, basically, of a, a hitchhiking ghost story mm -hmm. is, a, is a staple of American folklore. I mean, you can find it in, uh, um, I think you pronounce it, uh, John Brunfeld, I believe is his name. He was a, uh, a very uh, talented uh, author that wrote about uh, urban, urban legends and so forth. And almost every city has some sort of hitchhiking ghost, I would think. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I've been across the country. I've been in uh, various states, and I always seem to come across something. Now, some seem to be more credible than others because there seems to be more perhaps documentation that there was something that took place, uh, some traffic accident or some hit and run or something like that mm -hmm. that precipitated the ghost story, where others tend to be a bit more like urban legends or folk tales. Ghost trains. Uh, somebody was talking at lunch today about uh, ghost trains, and uh, they knew you were coming on the show. In fact, it's one of our camera operators here. And he wanted to me to ask you if you have had any experience investigating ghost trains. And to the best of your knowledge, what is a ghost train? Well, um, I have actually investigated several. In fact, probably one of the most famous is Lincoln's funeral train uh, that has been seen uh, when he was assassinated, obviously, in Washington, D.C., yeah. and then as he made the, 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 the trek to uh, uh, Springfield, to, to back to Illinois, which was his home, uh, people along the way would stop and, you know, uh, in real life, would stop and pay their respects. Yes. And, um, of course, since that time, and since, you know, since the, the, uh, the, the, de the decades has passed, there's been mm -hmm. uh, many reports of his funeral train being seen along train tracks, even though some of the train tracks are not even there anymore. In fact, in Irvington, uh, Indiana, uh, we were able to see where the funeral train went through. The tracks are no longer there, but people still see that train pulling up in, in Irvington, Indiana. Um, I've investigated other uh, places where um, trains have been seen, um, and in some cases, ghost lights associated with trains that might have been perhaps the, you know, the the um, the train uh, light on the front of the train. Right. Uh, people will see that train, uh, apparently a train coming towards them. They hear no no sound. The, the crossing guards don't come down alerting them that there's a train coming. And all of a sudden they'll get up on the tracks, they'll look down the tracks, and there's no, no, no longer a train there. Um, inanimate objects, and this is what people have often asked me, is it's how can an inanimate object uh, come back, you know, to be a ghost. It's like a mm -hmm. ghost car. Uh, uh, people have seen ghost houses and things right. like that. I think it's not so much that it's that it's uh, an inanimate object coming back to life, which it obviously can't. I think it's more or less some traumatic incident that has taken place back in time. And what you're seeing is a kind of re residual uh, replay of that event. Um, not only ghost trains, but ghost cars and and things of that nature have been reported in Chicago and across the country. And I've investigated a lot of these. Uh, they're very fascinating. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's just something that many people don't, you know, don't realize why these things show up. Well, you know, I, I've got a theory uh, because of the amount of time I've been in broadcasting way back when. We used to have to record everything on reel-to-reel -reel tapes and keep them for so many days for the CRTC and the FCC. Once that 
that's that real had you know was long enough and that you know we held it as as we had to we had bulk erasers the magnetizers mm -hmm. and what would happen not everything would be erased and what we would get would be like ghost sounds on the new tracks that we would that we would record on and i was just wondering is it possible that this is what we're seeing because of the electromagnetic field around the earth is that certain things and everything is recorded and that for one reason or another some aren't erased like on the bulk eraser like a um, space time fracture so to speak is is this a possible theory absolutely uh it's it, it, they they call this sometimes residual but right. another, another way that have people have um, um thought of this is a stone tape theory uh which is basically your you, something has been recorded yeah um if it if if you're recording something that had an energy at one time and again if you go back to Einstein, he says that energy can't be created nor destroyed. Right. So there has been some sort of tragedy or trauma or something, um, or in some cases, just you're recording somebody. Um, where does that energy go? Why isn't it completely gone? Well, it, it doesn't completely go according to theories, mm -hmm. uh, to science. Uh, it's always there. It's not always uh, strong enough that perhaps me or you or others might be able to encounter that. But in, some, in many cases that I've investigated, um, in fact, a lot of the cases that we've investigated seem to be that residual, uh, where there's not any real intelligence associated with it. It's just something, uh, the best way I've described it is something that has um, uh, embedded itself in the fabric of time and space. And right. for some reason, these things can replay itself to people uh, at certain times of the year, sometimes an anniversary of a death, a, a birth, uh, a tragedy or something of that nature, or very, very random. Um, one really good example very quickly is the Flight 191 in Chicago that crashed in uh, um, um, May 25th, 1979. All 282 passengers died. And we have been out to that location on the anniversary of that crash for several years in a row. And have gotten very, very good EVPs, and in some cases, what we call real-time EVPs, where we're actually able to hear the voices and the responses of the questions just asked. Fascinating. Dale Kazmarek is our very special guest this hour. His website is ghostresearch.org. And Dale and I will be back after this break as we continue here in the X Zone with yours truly, Rob McConnell, from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. <music> Question, what is the name of the unique blend of coffee you get that has been formulated by a neurologist, a neurobiologist, and a pharmaceutical chemist? Answer, you get Beautiful Mind Coffee, a unique coffee blend that tastes great and has herbal ingredients that your brain will love, and it is not just coffee, it's brain alicious. Dr. Rathbone, Dr. Jang, and Dr. Winslow, the scientific team that created Beautiful Mind Coffee, decided to collaborate on a coffee focusing on brain health. As for those herbal ingredients found in Beautiful Mind Coffee, Dr. Rathbone Dr. Jang, and Dr. Winslow, utilizing their combined extensive scientific research background, worked with many natural and herbal products until the exact formulation that is found in Beautiful Mind Coffee was created. With a unique scientific formula not found in any other coffee being sold or served, Beautiful Mind Coffee is the only coffee blend that contains three herbal ingredients found to aid in boosting your daily mental clarity and focus. Every cup of Beautiful Mind Coffee contains scientifically formulated amounts of maca root powder, green tea extract, and American ginseng, all supporting good brain health. Taking care of your brain's health now can help delay or prevent the onset of cognitive dysfunction, including dementia, Alzheimer's, and more general memory loss as you get older, just by enjoying the delicious flavor of our roasted coffee and herbal ingredients found exclusively in Beautiful Mind Coffee. 
Did you know that cognitive dysfunction also refers to deficits in attention, verbal and nonverbal learning, short-term and working memory, visual and auditory processing, problem-solving, processing speed, and motor functioning? For more on Beautiful Mind Coffee, the three scientists who formulated Beautiful Mind Coffee, and more details on the three unique herbal ingredients in Beautiful Mind Coffee, visit www.beautifulmindcoffee.ca. Beautiful Mind Coffee is now available online at Amazon.ca and Amazon.com. To order Beautiful Mind Coffee, visit www.beautifulmindcoffee.ca today. And I would like to let everyone know that uh, Beautiful Mind Coffee is available at Amazon.com and Amazon.ca. And if you'd like to find a local retailer near you, visit their website at www.beautifulmindcoffee.ca. Dale Kaczmarek is our special guest, www.ghostresearch.org. Um, we were talking about uh, uh, residual hauntings, I guess they could be called, Dale. Aren't, 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 I've been told that a lot of the castle hauntings, or some, or I should say that that there are those castle hauntings that happen at the same time of a of a time of a year, a day, a time. How does this happen? Well, again, um, it's it, it depends on the 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 trauma, the energy exerted, the energy mm -hmm. expelled uh, at, at one of these incidents. Uh, uh, I'll be traveling to uh, England in uh, the la latter part of May in the first two weeks of June. And one of the places where I'm going to be investigating or hope to investigate uh, would be the Tower of London. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's uh, reports of uh, one of King Henry VIII's uh, wives that was uh, uh, going to be beheaded. And, of course, that goes back to the, uh, uh, the 1600s. And her mm -hmm. ghost is sometimes still to this day running and seen screaming down the hallway trying to go towards uh, King Henry's uh, bedchambers to, to beg for her for her life, and uh, people have still seen that to this very day. Um, there are a lot of other locations that I've investigated that again um, have that sort of emotion, that sort of energy, and I think that has a lot to do with whether it's seen. Now, again, as I said before, this can be. Uh, for a anniversary, it could be a birth or death day, mm -hmm. or it could be totally random. Um, we, we, when we try to investigate locations um, that have had some sort of uh, trauma or accident or emotional outburst of energy, is the way I like to put it, uh, we try to get there during or before the anniversary date of something. And in some cases, we do get uh, a better result than just going on a random day. Now, again, if there is, are there, if there are spirits there, uh, the idea that if there is a lingering energy that cannot be destroyed, but it can just shift forms and change forms, mm -hmm. maybe that energy is there all the time, and people just don't realize that they don't they don't uh, go out there, you know, every you know, 365 days a year, they just sure. go randomly and they'll pick up something. Uh, we've had a lot of success sometimes going to. An anniversary date. Um, if does the weather have an effect on the investigation itself? For example, is are, is there more activity during a, a thunderstorm than there would be on a clear night, or it do, really doesn't matter? Um, again, we're talking about energy, and uh, um, a lot of times when there are storms coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. I was talking before the show, we had a storm that come, came through here. Yeah, right. Uh, pretty vicious that uh, um, didn't do any damage to my area, which was was, was good. But um, that added electricity in the air 
uh, those those free flowing ions that that energy created by thunderstorms and by lightning can actually, I believe, enhance the phenomena because um, if there is again something there on the form of a surviving personality, mm -hmm. they they sometimes will draw on some energies to to manifest or to talk. That's why in some cases uh, people feel somewhat drained when they go into a, a haunted house or something to do an investigation. Maybe the, the spirits are draining our energy. That's why equipment and batteries and tape recorders and so forth uh, yes. because they're draining, draining that. So I think there is a lot to do with meteorological uh, effects that can, can cause a phenomenon to be intensified. We're also looking at the possibility of maybe lunar implications, you know, the full moon, the, uh, the, the new moon and so forth, because, you know, the, the whole idea for the term lunacy comes yes. from the term lunar uh, moon and so forth. And police officers have often said that they get a lot more violent crimes, yeah. carjackings and so forth during the time of the full moon. So if it can affect us physically in the physical body, mm -hmm. it may be able to uh, uh, affect somebody that has left their body. Well, know? look what the moon look what the moon does to the tides, you know. Absolutely. A and of course, our body is mainly composed of water, so it would only make sense that the the uh, the way that the moon affects the tides would certainly affect us humans as well. Somebody calls you up and they say, Dale. Heard you on the X-Zone the other night. Saw you on X-Zone TV, on Simul TV. I have a problem. I would like you and your team to come and investigate what I consider to be a haunting. How would you conduct an investigation like that? Well, first of all, what I would do is interview them over the phone mm -hmm. and try to get all the relevant information about, you know, just general information and have them tell their story to me and their encounters in their own words uh, before I ask any questions, because I, um, I've i discovered throughout the many years I've been doing this is if you ask too many leading questions, you lead somebody down a trail. Right. You should just let them tell the story in their own words, which is what I like to do. Uh, so I'll do that first. And then you know, later on, we have a, about a, a, a 10 page questionnaire that we can go through that also asks about the, the type of home, is it on running water nearby, is it made of limestone, you know, other things like that that's, that may have a, a bearing on, on the case. Uh, we would then set up a time to go over to conduct an investigation with a small team, depending on the size of the home. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've done uh, investigations in mobile homes. I've done uh, investigations in 256,000 square foot buildings. Wow. Um, so um, we would bring in a, a team that's, that's um, uh, would be useful in the size of the home that we're going into, and they would work in teams of two. And we do this in three phases. Phase one is we go through with our equipment, with clipboards and and um, uh, floor plans of the location without telling any of my team what's going on. So I think that's more scientific that way, that this way people in my team don't have any preconceived notions what's going on. They don't go to the creepy attic or this or the or the, <laughs> the, the scary basement they just go throughout the building and uh, they will record whatever they pick up with their own bodies uh with their equipment and mark it on there then in phase two we would then sit down with the client and before the client says anything we have our team tell the client what they've experienced now, i've already talked to the client so i know at that point um they've told me the whole story and then we see how that matches up between what the client has experienced and what we have just picked up. In phase three, we would then set up our cameras uh, at these locations, uh, maybe other locations that maybe our team did not pick up anything yet. Uh, we would conduct EVPs. Uh, we would then try to find out if there was a communication that could be, uh, be held in some way, uh, find out why this ghost is there um, put out some other meters and devices uh, that would pick up uh, anomalous energy from electromagnetic uh, frequency to uh, uh, radiation to, uh, um, you know, uh, totally um, uh, invisible light, you know, use night shot cameras and things of that nature. And then um, <clears throat> after all that is compiled, uh, we may or may not have experiences. It really depends. I mean, sometimes we've been to a location that we get nothing at all. 
Uh, sometimes we get a whole bunch of stuff. We would then go back and review our evidence, our the pictures, the video, the audio, um, and then uh, write a report, uh, meet up with the client again in person, go over what we have experienced, and then see how that client wants to proceed from that point. Because a lot of times when people call us, it's not so much that they want an exorcism or they want something taken out of it. Sometimes they're just curious. Uh, they want to know that they're not going kooky. They're not going crazy. They want a verification from this. And in some cases, they think they know who it is. It might be Uncle Joe, Uncle Tom, and, and Bernice or something. And if it's that person, they don't want that person to be you know, expelled. They, they're mm -hmm. fine with that. So uh, we kind of go like that route. And if the, the client wants to take it a step further, then you know, we can always bring in you know psychics or mediums that we have worked with in the past to see what are the, what other um, avenues we can explore. Is there any connection between ghost hauntings and other dimensions? I believe so. Uh, I believe that in, in many cases, um, you know, the whole idea of um, a ghost, uh, again, it's a, I, I believe in some cases it can be a surviving personality. If you talk, right. about, if you talk about the, the, the intelligent ghost and not the residual, the residual is kind of a tape loop, but there can be intelligence where we get EVP responses. But in some cases, I believe, um, and, and many other investigators have also come up with this idea of, of portals, of interdimensional doorways, perhaps, where, mm -hmm. where spirits can, can go back and forth from time to time. And that's why maybe they're not here all the time. Maybe they are uh, whenever the, I hate to use this word, but the veil gets kind of thin at, at, at certain points that we can, can perhaps see and experience more spirits then uh, they may be all around all the time, but their, their energies may not be sufficiently strong enough for us to capture an EVP, to take a picture, to see them visually, which, which by the way, visual sighting is by far the least reported phenomenon. It's always, it's mostly sounds that people will experience rather than- Really? Uh, rather than physical manifestations. When using, uh, when using recorders for EVPs, what do you find to be the best method, the old analog or the new digital recorders? Um, we've actually used both, uh, mm -hmm. but I think um, right now we've, we've gotten a bit more results with the, the digital technology than the analog. Uh, we have, and we have employed uh, cassette tape recorders. We have uh, which uh, the old bulky reel-to-reel -reel tape yeah. recorders. We have portable devices we can actually bring in as well, but um, the the sound is very often not up to par, so to speak, as as, as the digital sound would be, and uh, we're able to uh, more easily you know import that into a computer. Mm -hmm. uh, that have, I have software that I can analyze and see in some cases where that voice falls in. Is it does it fall into a an avenue of uh, audible sound, or does it? Is it infrasound? Is it ultrasound? Is it beyond or below our, our hearing capabilities? Um, and most EDPs, as you as you know, are not heard uh, when they're recorded. They're usually only heard during playback. Is there any logic behind that? Yes, there is actually, because um, even the old analog um, uh, recorders, but mm -hmm. more so the digital technology actually records a wide variety of sound and sound um, energy, I guess you would call it, uh, even beyond what we can hear. It, it encompasses mm -hmm. a lot of different um, um, uh, frequencies that sometimes we just don't hear. Right. And because we don't hear it, um, it, it, the way it's recorded, is recorded directly onto the device, bypassing our physical ears to the point that only we can play, we, if, if it's, again, if it's strong enough, it can be transposed onto a digital recorder and then we play that back and hear that sound. Now, if we hear a disembodied voice, which is different, which is an audible sound that you actually hear as you're recording it. Now, those are very exciting and I've been privy to a lot of those. Uh, we, we heard at least nine disembodied screams that we heard and recorded at Trans Allegheny wouldn't take a silent in Western West Virginia a number of years ago. Uh, and this was just bone chilling. The I would imagine so, yeah. What was it like the first time you heard a disembodied sound? 
it was a it was a little bit uh, shocking. I I would say. I mean, I don't I don't get scared. What people have asked me all the time: Do you get scared? Do you run out of building? Yeah. No, I mean, that's what I'm there for. You know, if I hear a sound, if I see something, I'm going to run toward it. But I mean, the very <laughs> first time you hear something like that, it it is a little unnerving. I mean, it, it, it perhaps takes you by surprise because you don't expect that to happen. Uh, because again, that's something like the visual apparition. Where you don't often hear or see that that much it's usually something you take a picture of and you see later when you look at the picture or when you do an evp recording and you hear, yeah. hear the playback do you find the same thing happens with video recordings oh absolutely yeah. because uh, um, some of the video recorders we still use are um are taped recordings i mean they're they're using high eight uh cassette tapes which is which is magnetic recording tape, the same type of tape that you would find in the old uh, reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders, and in some cases, um, the uh, the uh, cassette tape recorders. So there is a very good possibility we have in the past recorded EVPs on the audio track of mm. video tapes that we did not hear at the time. Yeah. All right, Dale, please stand by. Always great talking to you. Thanks for taking time out of your busy day to join us. And uh, Dale... Kazmarek is our guest. His website is ghostresearch.org, and Dale and I will be back on the other side. And don't forget, he has a couple of books that are available on Amazon.com, as well as his website, which is, once again, ghostresearch.org. I'm Rob McConnell. This is The x -Zone. Dale and I return on the other side of this break. Don't go away. And the current edition of the X Chronicles newspaper is hitting the newsstands and online, I believe, April the 7th, which is a uh, week tomorrow. Explanation, our guest this hour, Dale Kaczmarek, ghostresearch.org. Uh, if there are ghost people, are there also ghost animals? Yes. Um, we have uh, uh, received many reports of... Uh, ghost animals. In fact, there are quite a number of books in my library that people have wrote, wrote, wrote about simply mm -hmm. just on the topic of animal ghosts. Um, there are several uh, here in the Chicagoland area, again, often associated with tragedy. Uh, there were um, some people and some horses that had died crossing the road from one uh, tra uh, riding trail to another. And people have seen 
to this day what looks like phantom horses and riders still trying to cross from one side to the other. They never make it across the street. Mm -hmm. Why? Because in, li in life, they never made it across the street. So it's like a residual type thing. But people have often experienced things in their own homes, uh, uh, cats and dogs that become family pets. They become part of the family because in some right. they live very, very long times, um, a number of years. But people have seen these experience. Now, maybe uh, they'll, they'll keep a memento from their, their cat or dog, and they'll see, mm -hmm. somebody, see the ball rolled across the ground like something's playing with it. They might uh, hear a purring of a, of a cat, maybe something rubbing against their legs like cats. Oh. Do, sensation of something jumping into the bed with them. And it's, it's, it's comforting to know, uh, at least in my, the way I look at it, the comforting to know that maybe you might be reunited with your pets on the other side because yeah. you know, they, they have a surviving personality as well. And they, they're very, they're very, very intelligent animals. And I think, you know, um, their own experiences that people have had, uh, and just what they have told me and indicate that, you know, pets do survive. Uh, after uh, after death, and they sometimes have very strong bonds with the with the living even after they die. You're in Chicago, right? Yes. Have you ever gone down to where the St. Valentine Day Massacre was and uh, investigated anything there? I've been there. Uh, I know the story well. Uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. the uh, the area where the St. Valentine's Day Massacre uh, took place, the old SMC Cartage Company garage, was was torn down in the 1990s oh, um, for urban renewal, as they say, in <laughs> Chicago. But there is a little park-like area on the south side of a uh, housing project for the elderly, which is uh, kind of chained off right now. I mean, you can get access to the back through the alley, but you probably should get permission. And uh, there are five trees, like the five spots of a playing card. And the center tree is just exact, almost exactly where the north wall would have stood where those men were lined up and shot uh, by um, obviously the the Capone gang um, back on February 14th, 1929. And people to this day have heard the sound of machine gun fire, automatic weapons fire, uh, dogs that walk past often react strangely because you know dogs and cats I mm -hmm. are, are, are perfect ghost hunters because they can sense things and dogs can actually hear ultrasonic sounds like a dog whistle. They can track people by scent alone. They have an incredibly gifted sight and vision, almost yeah. infrared. And uh, um, the, the interesting thing about the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, too, is that there was a dog involved with that, uh, a, um, a dog named Highball, who was the, the pet of... Um, of um, the uh, Bugs Moran's brother-in-law, uh, who was who was gunned down, um, and it, it, the funny part about it is he wasn't killed or anything. But when the police got word of what was going on, you know they didn't come because of the the machine gun fire and the shotgun blast they heard coming from the garage. It was the insistent barking and whining of the dog that actually drew police there as a, as a complaint for an animal complaint. And that's when they found all the men gunned down. So wow. with that, that being said, you know, that dog being an eyewitness and being very close to several men in the garage, mm -hmm. maybe that's some of the reasons that other animals are attracted to that as well. You know, has anybody ever thought of using a dog during a paranormal investigation because of their abilities? Yes. In fact, um, I was at a, a conference uh, oh, about a decade ago or so. And there was a uh, ghost hunting team that actually used a, um, um, a uh, I don't remember the, the breed of the dog, but it was named was Buster. He was the ghost busting dog. Gosh. And, uh, he was trained in some way. And I don't know exactly. Uh, you know, dogs are very highly, they can, they're very intelligent. You can train and them mentally. But how do you train a dog to pick up your spirits? Unless, again, again like I'm saying, they're hearing something mm -hmm. we don't hear. They're seeing something we don't hear, see. They smell something we don't smell, and so forth. And maybe that's where that that ghost busting um, technology comes in with the animals. Um, I've always told people that if you if you don't have uh, you don't want to bring in a, 
um, you know, a paranormal team or you don't want to bring in a psychic or a medium. If you know somebody who has a dog, bring a dog and let the dog go through the house. And if there's something going on, the dog or cat will usually let you know. In all the years you've been doing paranormal investigations, doing uh, collecting evidence and especially EVPs, have you ever caught a dog or another animal on an EVP that you relate to being a paranormal experience? Um, I've never photographed anything. Um, I believe there was one time that we, we may have picked up something that sounded like a dog in the background that mm -hmm. we did not hear at the time when we were recording. Uh, so it wasn't a disembodied bark, as you might call it. Uh, it, 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 it was an EVP. Um, it was something we did not hear at the time. Um, and again, this was at a private private residence. We were doing an investigation, and um, the um, the family member that that died in the home uh, had a dog, and then the dog was very attached to the woman. So when the woman died, the the dog, being very attached, was basically heartbroken and didn't live much longer afterwards. So when we went in to, to do an investigation to you know, discover if this woman was still around because people mm -hmm. thought that they'd seen and heard things, but we, had, we picked up what sounded like an animal in the background that sounded like a dog. You and I have to take our final break. Uh, please stand by. Dale Kazmarek is our guest, ghostresearch.org. And if you'd like to get any of uh, Dale's books, they're available on Amazon as well as from his website at ghostresearch.org. This is the Exxon. I'm Rob McConnell. Dale Kazmarek and I return after this break as we wrap up this hour here in the Exxon from our broadcast center and studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away, gang. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens and they kept repeating to me over and over again, Simultv.com, Simultv.com. What's Simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean Simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a Simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night, I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about Simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. SIMULTV.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about Simultv.com. SIMULTV.com. Wow, what an hour this has been. Uh, first of all, Dale, I want to thank you ever so much for joining us. Always great pleasure talking to you and continued success. And do the world a favor and keep on doing the great work you're doing. And uh, hopefully one day we'll be able to gather that evidence to prove beyond a shadow of doubt that all your hard work, dedication, and that of your team has proven that once and for all, there are ghosts. Uh, are we getting closer to that point in your opinion? I believe so, and I, the only reason I say that is when I first started back in the, uh, the mid-1970s, uh, there was no, no equipment, per se, that we have nowadays. I mean, I started off with a, a cassette tape recorder. Um, I had a, um, uh, my EMF device was a compass. Yeah, and, wow. Uh, you know, there, there really wasn't much out there. So, I mean, I've seen how the technology has finally caught up uh, first being adaptive, adapting certain things to paranormal research. And then now so many people out there building specific devices make only for this express purpose of trying to gather evidence for ghosts or the paranormal. And I think in, in that aspect with, with those bright minds and 
you know, the next generation of uh, ghost researchers out there. Uh, I think you know, there may be some major breakthrough uh, somewhere in the horizon uh, where people will be able to uh, have something that will definitively prove the existence of ghosts. If you remember Einstein, uh, excuse me, uh, Thomas Edison himself, he was designing so, so yeah. supposedly some sort of communication device. Uh, the plans were never found, it was never completed. But if anybody would have been able to build an invention, and he had so many inventions, he would have been the, the person to do that. So I really believe it's, it's, it's the technologies and the equipment that's going to make the breakthrough uh, here. Uh, I think we're, we're on a better path now than before, uh, because now we're, we're able to perhaps hear the actual voices coming through on these real-time devices. Uh, not all the time they make sense, but in many cases they do. Uh, we have so many examples of full sentences coming out and um, direct responses to our questions. So it's not just uh, random words coming through. So I think that's where the, uh, the breakthrough will come. Dale, do you think that the other side, ghost spirits, they want to make that connection that they really try hard to connect with researchers like yourself because you believe you're dedicated? Uh, do they know this? And, and is this why researchers like yourself get the results you get? I think so. And I, you know, the reason I say that is even going back, you know, a generation before mine, when they had Dr. Konstantin Radove, Professor Hans Bender, uh, and, and uh, you know, Friedrich Jurgensen and other very early EVPers, uh, George Meek, for example, another name that pops up, uh, when they were communicating with friends and friends, scientists, friends that had passed over, uh, they they indicated in through some of their EVPs and some of their responses they were getting mm -hmm. is that the other side was actually telling them how to make the device better what frequency they needed to go, how to adjust it better. And they, these are some of the EVPs that, that you can actually find if, right. you, if you go on these internet uh, uh, programs and so forth. So I think they are trying to reach out to us in some cases to, to make that communication, to make that uh, connection from the other side. Dale, before we say so long, what are your final thoughts uh, that you'd like to share with the Exxon Nation tonight? Well, again, as, as I always do, I mean, if, if anybody ever has an experience, is it's just nothing to be frightened of or scared of. Uh, it, it, I've never come across anything harmful as far as a ghost uh, or, or, or an entity, even poltergeist phenomena. Uh, there's never been anybody struck by a flying object, so it's nothing to be scared of. Uh, the best thing you can do is document your experiences and you know, reach out to a paranormal team if you have uh, concerns and let them uh, do the investigation. Don't take it upon yourself to do that. Uh, but there, there are a lot of good teams out there. Uh, that can help you and assist you in uh, your need to know. Dale, as always, thank you so much for your time. Great talking to you. Give my very best to your family as well as your team, and I look forward to the next time we meet back here in the Exxon. It's always a pleasure. You take care, my friend. At Exxon Nation, if you'd like to contact Dale, visit his website, ghostresearch.org, and for his books and all the work that he does, it's a great website please, ghostresearch.org. I'll be back on the other side of the news at uh, six and a half minutes past the top of the hour as the Exxon continues with yours truly right here on the Talkstar Radio Network, Exxon Broadcast Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, and on Channel 32, the Exxon TV channel, exclusive to Simul TV. I'm Rob McConnell. Don't go away. From the Canada-US border in the southern region of Niagara, traveling north in Ontario's Golden Horseshoe, then, east and west of the Greater Toronto Area, there is growing awareness and excitement as more and more people are starting their day with Beautiful Mind Coffee, the delicious healthy coffee that your brain will love. Made with ethically sourced 100% Arabica coffee, Beautiful Mind Coffee is roasted and ground in small batches, to ensure each bag contains a wonderful full-bodied artisan coffee. Scientifically formulated, Beautiful Mind Coffee is the only coffee blend that contains three herbal ingredients found to aid in boosting your daily mental clarity and focus. Maca root powder, green tea extract and American ginseng, have been selected for their ability to support good brain health. 
Taking care of your brain's health now can help delay or prevent the onset of cognitive dysfunction, including dementia, Alzheimer's, and more general memory loss as you get older just by enjoying the delicious flavor of our roasted coffee and herbal ingredients found exclusively in Beautiful Mind Coffee. Beautiful Mind Coffee is now available at Amazon.ca and soon to be available in selected locations near you. In Hamilton, Ontario, Beautiful Mind Coffee is now available at Livelong Wellness Clinic, located at 189 Houston Street South. Beautiful Mind Coffee can be ordered by telephone by calling 416-436-3675 or 905-536-2450. Why have a good cup of coffee when you can have a great cup of Beautiful Mind Coffee that's good for your brain? For more information on Beautiful Mind Coffee, visit us online at www.beautifulmindcoffee.ca.